Now, this series, Songs of Jesus, you heard Diana talk about Psalm 40. It was a little bit of a roller coaster psalm. Here's what I want us to get out of this psalm this morning. We are impatient as people. This psalm teaches us how to be active waiters, how to wait actively, how to not be passive in our waiting, but to actively wait on God. I don't know, but I want to ask you, what are you waiting for in this season of life? For some of us, it may be just a paycheck. We, we need that uh, just money to, to, to get by. Others of us are waiting for maybe that job to come through, that promotion uh, to come to pass. Some of us are, are waiting for a baby that, that is yet to be born. Some of us are waiting for this prayer that we've been praying for for many, many, many years. Others of us are waiting for a relationship to be reconciled and restored. Some of us are waiting for a loved one to come to know Jesus. Some of us are waiting for healing and others are waiting for uh, so, so many things this side of heaven. Here's the thing. Waiting is hard, isn't it? David in this psalm starts by saying this in Psalm 40 verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. The first thing as we have looked at, at these Psalms, how they teach us to adore, how they teach us to admit, and how they teach us to aspire. Adore is what we learn about God from this Psalm. Admit is what we learn about ourselves through this Psalm. And then aspire is what we are learning from this Psalm, what it's compelling us to do. The first thing that we learn about God in this Psalm is that God delivers. He is the ultimate deliverer. He has delivered us from our sin. He is the faithful God who comes through with every single one of his promises that is written right here. Some of us pray and, and we pray for things kind of like that are on our Amazon wish list. Here's the thing about those. Those are things that we want. We need to be praying for what God wants. When we pray according to his will, he will come through. God delivers right here. He turned to me and heard my cry. That word turned is this word inclined, which literally means that Jesus and God, I'm sorry here, uh, Jesus and God, uh, to David, he leaned in. He leaned in and he heard him. And then he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise, to our God, many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. God delivers. Anybody out there? Here's the thing. These three things are beautiful ways that God delivers us. The first, that God lifted him out of this spear, out of this slimy pit, out of this mud and mire. Mire is another word for swamp stuck in our sin, no way out. You try by your own strength, but what happens when you're stuck in a pit? When was the last time you're stuck in a pit? We don't really find ourselves stuck in pits. We slip. See, sin is a slippery slope. We think that just one sin is harmless. We think that one thought is harmless, but every single sin leads to death. And when we uh, try to fix our mistakes by our own strength, we will continue to fall into that pit. But when we set our eyes on Jesus, when we call upon the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, uh, this psalm teaches us that we are set on solid ground. And God puts a new song of praise in our mouth. This word, hymn of praise, is the same Hebrew word that we get the word psalm from. So he puts a psalm in our mouth. Maybe it's a Spotify song or an Apple Music song or a song that you heard here that, that you just feel God doing something in you. Again, we learned last week that music is a medium that helps us process how we are Feeling And God here is teaching us that he is our deliverer. Let's continue reading in verse four. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done, things you planned 
for us. Hey, if your kids went to kids camp, this is a great week to remind them. This was their memory verse. Hey, what was your memory verse from kids camp two, two weeks ago? Right here, many Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. It'd be a great reminder for them. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Think about it. God has delivered us from so much, so much that David doesn't even know where to start. Well, I want us to start here this morning. Here's my question when it comes to how God has delivered us. How has God come through in my life? How has God come through in your life? Start with one. Start with one thing. God has forgiven me of this. And then think about something else. God has delivered me from this and this and this and this. And as we look back and thank God for how he has come through in our life, that's how we start actively waiting on God. Because we don't need to wait on anything to happen for us to give God praise for what he has already done. Done. Here's what verse 9 says. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I don't hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Here's what happens when we share what God has delivered us from. We actually talk about the good news of what God is doing here on earth. And there's a lot of bad news. It's not hard to find bad news, right? Well, the good news should come from this place. When we share with one another, hey, I was heading down this path, but then God sent a friend or God sent someone to say, no, no, no. Hey, over here, I had a God moment, a revelation from the Lord, and then I pivoted, I repented, I turned, and God delivered me from that thing. Or I deserve this consequences, but thanks be to God and his amazing grace. Now I was blind, but now I see. We need to be sharing those stories stories with one and other, how God has delivered us here in, uh, in this life. Here's the thing about actively waiting. It's hard. It's, it's, it's really hard. Uh, and, and, and I don't know if you've ever been on hold waiting for someone to answer the phone so that they can help with, you know, anything. I was on the phone yesterday. My internet provider Put something on my bill that shouldn't have been there. You know, have you ever had one of those things happen and you're like, shoot, now I need to call and I need to get this off my bill. So I was calling and they didn't have that sweet new thing now where you can press one, put your number and they call you back 40 minutes later. No, they made me wait for 40 minutes. And I thought, what am I going to do for 40 minutes while I wait? My garage is now orderly and clean. (laughs) I was waiting for something and I was active at the same time. That's what we're getting at here in this psalm. We can be waiting for something to happen and be active in the same, at the same time. The first thing is how has God delivered us? Let's be active in praising him. Let's be active in thanking him and sharing what he has delivered us with those around us. If you are with me, say amen. Thank you, three of you. Let's go to the second thing. Admit, it, waiting is taxing. We need to admit that. That's what this psalm is teaching us about ourselves. The first thing that, that, that David is writing is saying, hey God, I waited patiently for you. If you actually flip your pages back, the last three psalms, 37, 38, and 39, all talk about waiting. And so quickly we read, David waited, God turned, inclined, answered. But the last three words or the last phrase of Psalm 40 is, my God, do not delay. So he goes back to waiting. Waiting is taxing. It's hard. We all wait. Have you ever been waiting to board a plane and recognize that the human species is impatient? (laughs) I mean, it's Bananas, I was thinking about this, and and you may be thinking like, actually, no, well then you may be the impatient one, or you've never really flown on a commercial airline, because you, you are waiting to go from an ample, comfortable, for the most part, airport, depending where you are, airport, and, and you're waiting to be funneled down this tunnel into a compact thing that is going to take off and has not that much oxygen or space and, you know, makes you feel claustrophobic all the time. And people are just dying to get in. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? It speaks to our impatience. We can't wait. 
that's the next thing. I just want to get on there. I want to, you know, show off my, I have all these miles. And then you realize that you have all those miles on another airline. And so then you vow, I'm never going to fly on that airline ever again. I've never been disrespected in that way, you know. And, and then you get people that are like, oh, looking at their watch and they're looking around. And, and, and the worst, here's the thing about impatience. And here's the thing that makes waiting so taxing is that waiting has a wingman. And it's called complaining. Whenever we get impatient, we want to complain. And the complainer wants to look at other people that also complain. You know, like, can you believe this? And they look over and, and they're wanting you to join them in their complaining. And what do we do? We join. And so all of a sudden, complaining is contagious. And we just have this whole ball of impatient complainers that are all going to board the same airline and go to the same destination. I just needed to get that off my chest. <laughs> Thank you for listening to my spiel. So here's the life hack for that. Check your bag. Don't wait for an overhead bin. Check your bag and you'll be free from waiting. And so you can just wait, drink your latte or your favorite beverage in the airport and just wait till everybody boards and then you can sit and then the flight time will be less. Thank you for listening. I know that you're glad that you got that life hack. But the reality is, is that this is a human Problem. See, from the very beginning of time in the Bible, we read that humans are impatient. The people of God, the Israelites, were in slavery for 400 years in Egypt, and then they were delivered. They celebrated their Independence Day when Moses was used by God to deliver the people out of Egypt, out of slavery, into freedom, in, into the desert. For Remember, it was supposed to be only 40 days. You keep that on the back of your mind. What happened quickly? They got impatient. Why aren't we there yet? Why aren't we there? Are we there yet? Are we there yet, Moses? We're not there yet. And then they got hangry, literally. They, they didn't have any food. And so God rained manna, that's bread from heaven to earth. He delivered them, you know, some, some Uber Eats pretty quickly from heaven. And then you know what happened? They grumbled, not enough protein. And so then quail literally showed up the next morning, but that didn't suffice. They were still complaining. They were impatient. And if you think, oh, that was only them, this is all of us, y'all. This is the human uh, condition. After they had manna, uh, the Bible says that Moses went up to Mount Sinai. He came down. He brought all these laws and regulations. We're going to talk about sacrifices here in a little bit. And, and then he said, all right, guys, here's what God says. If we do these things, we will be blessed. If we don't do these things, then we will be cursed. And in uh, all one voice, Exodus 24, verse 3, when Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said, we will do. And then Moses went back up to Mount Sinai, and he took too long. And just a few chapters later, in Exodus 32, 1, says this, when the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. Waiting is taxing. It's hard. We would much rather bring matters into our own hands and form an idol so that we can be in charge. It's what happened at the Garden of Eden. We said, I don't want to trust God. I'd rather do things my way. Way And the reality is, is that our way is getting faster. We are getting faster at getting things. So if we're impatient, what do we do? We pull out our phones. We don't want to go to Target. We don't want to go to H-E-B. Pull out our phones and we order whatever we need. And it is here in a few hours, if not a day or two. It's craziness, y'all. It's the human condition. We have to admit it later on in Numbers 13, uh, we read that Moses brought some, sent some spies in to the promised land. So God delivered them out of Egypt, and he said, hey, I have a land for you. It's going to be awesome. Go check it out. What happened? They came back. They're too big. They're too dangerous. They're too many. Those cities are massively fortified. There is no way that God will actually do what he said he would do because they didn't believe. They didn't trust. And so those 40 Days turned into 40 years. So here's what happens when we look at our current circumstance and we say, well, I don't know how it's going to happen. And we feel tempted to take matters into our own hands. What this verse is about to teach us is that we need to obey right now. 
We may not have the life that we want. We may not have received the healing that we want to see. Or God, uh, th this, this process that he has us on, we may not be on the other side, but there is something that God wants us to be obedient with right now. Here's what he says in verse 6. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come, it is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will. My God, your law is within my heart. In another part of the Bible, it says that God actually doesn't want sacrifice. He wants obedience. Sacrifice is when we just check the box off. See, God, I did that for you. Now I want you to, 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 to come through. It's conditional. When we say, Lord, I desire to do your will, that's out of an overflow of what he has done for us. Religion focuses on what we have done for God or what we are doing for God. This relationship, this gospel response comes from what he has done for us. That is true. Obedience, and we don't need to wait on that. We can just be faithful and obey God with something right now. Hebrews 10 quotes Psalm 40 in uh, verses 8 through 10. It says this, first, he said, so uh, David said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them. So that's verbatim. Then, though they were offered in accordance with the law. So what the author of Hebrews is saying here is that he still gave the law. He still gave all of these ways for human sin to be atoned for by bull sacrifice and goat sacrifice. Uh, but then he says this. Then, verse 9, he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. That's what we just celebrated when we partook in communion together. That on that day when Jesus' body was broken for us and his blood was spilled for us, that fully covered all of our sin, the whole requirement of the law was fulfilled so that we wouldn't have to just try really, really hard to please God. All we needed to do is call upon the name of Jesus and say, Lord, I believe that you died for me, that your sacrifice was truly perfect and fully covers the extent of my sin. Isn't he a good God? Isn't he an awesome, mighty, wonderful God that he would do that for us First, we need to admit that we are impatient and then we receive from him. So here's the question, what? How is God asking me to obey him right now? Again, we don't need to wait. We don't need to expect an external circumstance to change for us to make an internal change in our hearts. And here's the last question. Aspire, how does this psalm compel me to respond. Well, well, the psalm pivots here near the end. In verse 11, David starts going another way. So he was talking about, you know, giving God praise and thanks. And he's saying, God, I want to desire to do your will. I want to be obedient. But then he starts going uh, more to, towards a negative tone. We saw this last week also with Psalm 139. He says this in verse 11, do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me for troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord, and quickly and come quickly, Lord, to help me. This is a drastic change from, Lord, you've done so many things for me, I cannot even count them. I can't even speak to them. It was a pretty drastic change. And what this teaches us again is that these Psalms teach us to be real before God. Some of us are waiting for things, and, and this is the, des the tone of desperation that, that we have right now. Lord, it's too much. Lord, the consequences of my sin, too heavy. I can't see a way out. And, and David not only talks about his own sin, but then he starts comparing. See, when we are waiting for something to happen and it hasn't yet happened, the, uh, the twin to worrying is comparison. We start comparing, well, he has it. Well, 
Her life is fine. Well, they have it all together. And so, Lord, what's going on with me? Why haven't you come through for me? Verse 14, may all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. May, uh, but may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say the Lord is great. David is teaching us to bring our emotion, whatever it may be, to God. And he had literal enemies, okay? So there were literally people, there were literally people chasing after David to end his life. I sure hope that's not the case for any one of you. But if that were to be the case, David is teaching us, hey, that's, that, that, that's what we do. We just turn to God and say, Lord, May your justice be done because God is a just God. And, and the Bible in Romans teaches us, do not repay evil for evil. Uh, allow God to be the just one who brings vengeance on, on those. That's not our job. That's God's job. But here's the deal with our enemies. A lot of the times, it's just in our head. We, we, we read these aha, aha, and, and we think that a bunch of people are, are looking at us and are wanting ill will against us when the reality is it's, it's just all in here. It's not true, but what David is teaching us here is just go to God. Go to God with how you are feeling, and then you will receive his comfort. You'll receive his mercy. But as for me, verse 17, this is the end of the psalm. I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not. Delay. This psalm teaches us that when we are worried, when we are afraid of the future, we can just trust God and surrender it fully to him. Because bottom line, there are only so many things that we can control here on earth. But God, he is fully in control. We aspire to trust God with our future. And the question, what is one thing that I can surrender to God? Maybe it is worry. Uh, maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a financial situation that seems overwhelming and you're waiting for something to change. Again, how do we actively wait? We look back. How has God come through in our life? We're grateful for what he has done. He's delivered us. And then we look down. What is God asking me to be obedient with today? And then we look forward. God, I don't know what that's going to look like, but I'm just going to go ahead and trust you and surrender. May your will be done just like David did. I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. John 11, this is how I want to close. Jesus was uh, brought, uh, something was brought to his attention. Mary and Martha were good friends of Jesus and so was this brother Lazarus and Lazarus was sick. So Martha calls Jesus and says, hey, um, Come on and, um, you know, help because my brother is sick. And, and so Jesus uh, does something a little strange. He doesn't go right away. He actually says, your, your, your brother will not die. Um, God will be glorified through what he will do for him. Uh, for a lot of us in our waiting season, we need to take that to heart, that God will be glorified through whatever may come next. It may not be what we want or, or what we are necessarily asking for, but ultimately we want God to be glorified. And, and then he hears that his friend Lazarus dies. And so Jesus goes over to the village uh, in, in Bethany, and he sees many people weeping, and, and Martha comes up to him and says, Jesus, you waited too long. She, she, she grew impatient, and she rebuked you. If you would have come sooner, he would have lived. And then she pivoted real quickly and said, but, but you, anything that you ask God, I know he will give to you. And then Jesus said, Martha, your brother will rise again. And, and she says, yeah, I know. I know it's the heaven answer. Everything will be good in heaven and it's going to be hard here. And then Jesus says this in John 8, 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? See, there is going to be a resurrection. 
when, when the heaven will come to earth, when, when we are face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ, where there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering, no more sin. That's going to be a good day. He also promises us life right now. John 10, 10 says abundant life, a life to the full, that we can start by saying yes to Jesus. No matter what our circumstance may be, no matter what we are waiting for, we can be waiting with the Lord. We can be in this, in this hard season, side by side with Jesus. That's what he promises us. He promises us his presence. He promises us his peace that transcends all understanding. And so that's how I want to close by asking in this psalm, in this song that Jesus is saying to us, he is promising us his very presence. And so if, if you're willing and able, stand as we close in prayer and in worship. Lord, we thank you for all the ways that you have delivered us, God. We thank you for the ways that you have called us today through this time together to be obedient to you. Pray for courage and boldness to make that step. Lord, we thank you that you take worry away when we just surrender and trust you. May your will be done. And we thank you, God, for everlasting life that is here for us every day, this eternal mindset that you have given us. And God, I pray for anyone in the house that is yet to say yes to you, Jesus. We started by praying for those that did not know Jesus personally or, or maybe for those that have wandered away and are ready to come back. And God, we thank you that we can be waiting for you, but you are always waiting for us. And so if that's you, know that he's waiting for you and he's looking at your heart He's not looking at your life and, and your mistakes or your thoughts. And all he wants is for you to come back to him. He created you. So as a symbol of coming back to him, you can say words like these, Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God, and that you paid the perfect price and you were the perfect sacrifice for my sin. I believe that your life, death, and resurrection promises me everlasting life starting today and to eternity. In Jesus' name, we thank you, God, for the gift that is free. We thank you, God, for true freedom in you this morning. And we celebrate what you're doing in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen.